Okay, so we are starting with a short delay with, with our next uh, session, um, which actually means uh, uh, is named as supporting the development of organic uh, now as a roundtable discussion. And it's a pleasure as, uh, to moderate this. As director of IFOMU, I present you the panelist. And uh, having two of the e institution on my right, um, you already saw um, Diego Kanga, founder from a director in, in uh, DG Agriculture of the European Commission, at least in one workshop, and now also here in plenary. I was here seen this morning um, from the Latvian presidency. And to my left, uh, Martin Heusting, you have also seen uh, from the European Parliament and rapporteur on the organic dossier. And on my left, left we have uh, Sierpa Hirtel, who is the city council chancellor of, uh, and also the rapporteur of the Committee of Regions, so another um, European body, on the, and, and she was rapporteur on the Committee of Regions on the dossier of organic farming. And uh, you are from uh, Finland also. And last but not least, our IFOMU Vice President, Thomas Fertel, and also working for B Austria um, in Austria. So I think it's more, I would like to ask some entry statements and then immediately continue discussion that I think was already initiated by um, the reports back from the session. Um, and there was one statement, I think one rapporteur said uh, that we want a cocktail, we accept that it's uh, not tasty, um, but we don't want to be poisoned. And I think I agree, I was um, very clearly going to the beach now, having a lot of cocktails, it's really, really pessimistic and not really good vision. So, and my question to all of you, and perhaps you can start, I was how we can make sure that in future we, our ambition for organic farming to support organic and having a good future for organic is going a little bit more towards tasty cocktails, which we both agree is important. Yes, uh, thank you, Marco, very much. And, uh, um, I like to cut uh, things short sometimes, and I think uh, I would have to repeat what uh, some of my colleagues have said earlier here, and I would have to reiterate it again. I think the, the tasty part of the cocktail, uh, as it stands on the table, uh, again, I'm talking narrowly about this regulation, and I will talk a bit more uh, wider in a second, uh, is the part that concerns uh, import uh, and the uh, competitiveness of the of the EU uh, producers than in a wider scale. And I think that if you read out what is in the paper, if you just don't think by drinking a tea or beer or coffee, uh, watching TV at home, but if you read what is on the table, because you're, uh, when it comes to iPhone, I mean, you, you, you have the files via different member states and you, you, you have it access to that, so it's very transparent, I think. You know what's going on. And I think on import, uh, the package is giving a good taste and I stress, not to every operator, but to EU farmers. That I should stress. Because if you look at it from the angle of somebody who wants to operate in Europe, to sell to uh, rich European consumers something that is made of uh, ingredients produced somewhere else outside Europe, then he or she may see this package that is on the table in the Council at the moment uh, of not uh, going uh, any better than the status quo. And why is that? It's because currently you have over 60, I think, uh, different standards yeah, that are uh, carried, carried out across the scene instead of us uh, uh, proposing the two-tier two approach, either then uh, in a short coming future tr trade agreements or compliance. So this is to cut it short, uh, I think I couldn't have been uh, shorter than that when it comes to the tasty part of the cocktail. I understand that uh, a large part of you uh, may not seem happy at all of even thinking about anything that comes close to, to setting threshold levels. But here again I can say that uh, when it comes to the Council's institution, we've been trying our best with Commission not always being so happy, but uh, I think uh, Diego and the colleagues have been also compromise minded. Uh, that, that we don't set the, the, the thresholds huh? now. I mean, in our paper, we don't set the thresholds. This is process-oriented approach. That's what it clearly is. We build on that basis, and everybody has to understand that. Where, of course, we have, however, provisions for member states to keep is for their own producers. Producers, not operators. So, uh, a member state X could not refuse Latvian organic cheese just because they would find 
a residue there and do automatic desertification. If what stands on the table in the Council, Latvian cheese would have to be investigated well in that case if you find the residues. And I think this, this is a huge difference. And I like to explain that by examples very often, also when we talk to, to, to our colleagues uh, in member states or, or to, to IFOM colleagues. And here I come to, no, to, to a little bit another point. I think uh, consumers uh, are confident, even despite, in, in my evaluation, of the, of the recent few, um, a bit of uh, scandalous or misleading cases that have been there in Europe about frauds or so. My own uh, estimation is that that has not created a, a scandalous recession in the organic farming. I think rather opposite, it's still growing, and I'm happy about uh, seeing that. And I think it has a future, and I think it will. Uh, so, especially in, in EU, because we still have uh, rich enough consumers who will be more and more concerned about what they are consuming, in what environment they are living, and in what environment uh, our grandchildren will live. I think that's, that's what it is about. So, um, but thank you for taking, uh, taking the cocktail uh, notion from, from what somebody said early, earlier this morning, uh, because indeed, uh, when you make policy, this is about uh, compromises. I hope, I hope this clarifies, and I hope this uh, contributes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ivas. And uh, I would like to go to uh, Diego. I mean, thanks for also coming again, yeah, uh, because uh, I said as a jo half joke to, to Diego, look, uh, we have in the cup organic is green by definition, but to criticize the commission by definition is not eye for me policy, but uh, the passionate discussion on the regulation uh, gives sometimes the impression. So on the other hand, we're looking forward also to look and getting a positive spin to develop organic farming together in future. And perhaps you can indicate some elements uh, because uh, whatever now happens, but if there would, would be, for example, a deal, there are other challenges, there are implementing rules, we have an action plan, to the conference and an expo and on research. So there are more elements. So what can uh, make us looking confident that we find a way of, of developing organic farming uh, in future in the EU and continue um, and, and having a positive uh, spin again also? Th thank you very much, uh, Marco. I'm happy not to talk about the regulation for once. So three messages from my side, replying to your question, support and development. I'm going to mention money soft law and international dimension, money. Now, 6% of the 95 billion euros of rural development will go to organics in the next few years. That means 5.7 billion euros will be injected into organics. That's the choice of your governments, but that's a considerable amount of money which is going to be there. Second thing, research and development, Horizon 2020, there is a specific program where there is also money for research and development and organics. Third point, promotion regulation, on which I am responsible. You know that there is a new regulation to facilitate exports. Now, uh, uh, this regulation has been used by the organic sector only 23 times. So we have co-financed 23 projects of promotion. I'm sorry, that's very little. That's very little, so you have some homework to do over there. There is a very generous regulation where we will co-finance 80% of the investment, where it facilitates uh, selling uh, organic foods outside the European Union. So there are opportunities uh, to, uh, which can be co-financed. Second message from you, soft law. Uh, let me copy what I heard last time I was uh, with you, Nuremberg, and I heard uh, the Danish minister is saying something which I found amazing. So in Denmark, I'm sorry the Danes in the room should know it better than I do. In Denmark, there is an agreement between the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of the Army, whereby the soldiers in Denmark are obliged to eat organic food on a regular basis. I'm, not, I'm just quoting what the minister said. Imagine this happens in France. How many soldiers eat in France every day? Half million? I don't know. Just think that once a week you eat organics. What I'm saying is that one thing that could be done, I mean, I found this Danish idea wonderful. I'm sure that there are also brilliant ideas in Latvia, in Austria, Germany, everywhere. And this is soft law. There is no need to add a regulation. It's just a matter of political will to put emphasis on organics. And I think we need to disseminate those best practices 
to increase more and more consumption of organics. And my final point, international dimension. Sorry to be a bit provocative. Are we the best of the planet in organics? Maybe, because the Americans are doing a good job. And I hate being second, personally. And I think we Europeans have to develop more and more our market because I really want Europe to be the best place in the planet to develop organics. And, and we might need one day to export a bit more. We might need one day to have a plurilateral agreement, maybe, with the States, Canada, Switzerland, Norway, I don't know. And we have to develop also our bilateral agreements. Again, that has nothing to do with the regulation. It's just a matter of political will. Uh, organic is a fantastic sector which creates growth, jobs, it attracts young people, it attracts women, so it's the perfect sector. So there's a huge potential, so enough, enough dispute of the regulation, and let's think positively. Thank you, Marco. Um, thanks a lot, Diego. And uh, I think looking a little bit uh, out of the scope of only regulation, I mean, you will decide as plenary to what extent you want to focus on different aspects. But I would like to come to uh, Mr. Sattel to also give us an outlook what you consider as the key elements also for an, uh, further development of organic, because your report, or as a rapporteur, you were quite keen and, and, and dealing with the issue, perhaps you can also, looking on connecting just what the Commission said, to what extent you can back this up or what elements you can add and, and additionally bring in. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's very nice to be here with you. Uh, as um, moderator said, I'm, I come from Finland and I'm a member of the Committee of Regions. And as you probably know, or maybe you not know, because there are not so many who know what Committee of Regions are doing, but we represent all the uh, local level in all, all EU countries, cities and villages and towns and all the local, local level. Uh, and about this um, organic farming, the Committee of Regions has long been aware of the need to promote the development of organic products. The market for organic products has grown much in recent years and organic farming has become a significant source of employment and income in rural areas. The Committee of Regions actually adopted an opinion last year, uh, the policy package on organic production. And um, mm, uh, as you know, local and re regional authorities are directly involved in developing, developing organic farming in the regions, for example, by co-financing specific measures under the Rural Development Program. That's the, uh, why the Committee of Regions strongly regrets uh, that the Commission's action plan completely ignores the key role of local and regional authorities uh, in developing organic farming. Uh, indeed, uh, local and regional authorities have a big role to play in developing organic production uh, in their regions. The, there are several ways that they can use upstream, such as land policy encouraging farmers to move the area of switch, or switch to organic farming, as well as downstream uh, by increasing demand, creating local markets, and ensuring that those who take up organic farming have an outlet for their products. Uh, the, um, our opinion contains three reasons for this appointment. I want to say them here at the beginning, because it's, uh, I think it's important. There was no specific objective in the form of a target for expansion of the sector. So no, no specific object, objective. And the plan has no budget of its own, and the local and regional dimension is missing, missing totally. So this at the beginning, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and I will give the word to um, the, the representative of the European Parliament, of the European Parliament. Of course, uh, Mar uh, Martin, you have an interest in organic farming by profession yourself, and now the whole parliament, um, they don't have too many dossiers in the Acqui Committee, so they all deal now with organic. But what is, uh, your f so how much support, beside of now, when, when you once have uh, done the job and, and, and there's a dossier, and a position, and of course a trial look, but what do you think and estimate, what other support is possible we can, and a sector, and can expect from the European Parliament to really enhance the development uh, in Europe? 
Yeah, thanks a lot for excellent invitation. <laughs> uh, interesting to uh, feed soldiers with organic, uh, but I think we need more money from the military sector for organic. Is my view. <laughs> so um, now, when we finish our the work on the new regulation, then we talk about the new CUP 2020. Uh, and we tried to change the cup, the last cup, for more money uh, for the agriculture, for the organic agriculture sector. And when you have a look, we spent yearly 55 uh, billion for the agriculture sector, and only only uh, three or four percent are spent for organic. I think when we when we try to say organic is the future of agriculture, we have to spend more money for the sector and not only in the second pillar. <coughs> and we need to try a strategy. Uh, we try to bring in uh, the organic sector in the strategy 2020 for the European Union. We say, okay, we have a good strategy, but why is agriculture out and why is not the best sector of agriculture, the organic sector, in the strategy 2020. Sorry, we, we don't became it in because the majority of the conservative uh, members in the committee, they don't want it. And this is the main problem. We have the majority in the parliament. They focus the way on a more intensive agriculture. You, when you have a look to Milano now, the World Expo, they we have to feed the world and we have to push more money in a sector that, that fails on a lot of points uh, and I think it's not the right strategy. We must tell the people and tell the consumers organic is the answer to feed the world in the next 50 years because um, the conventional sector there are so much problems with environment, with biodiversity, uh, with climate change. The only organic way of farming is a way in the future. And we don't have to promote more uh, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, or more chemical industrial agriculture for the future. And this is the main debate. And in, in my country, in Hessen, we make a new coalition between Greens and Christ Democrats. And the first point I bring in in the coalition is we have to bring organic, the organic movement in the school so that everyone's children, but in the new farmer generation, had to learn something about the organic agriculture. In, in a school system in Germany, uh, you learn conventional agriculture, not the future agriculture, not organic agriculture, and we change it. And now the school come to my farm and say, okay, we want to try to learn uh, what is organic agriculture uh, for the new generation of young farmers. And this is the main point to change something in the heads of the young farmers. This is the way for the future. It's not only a niche. Uh, thank you, Martin. And then, uh, yeah, Thomas, you have, uh, I saw you that you were following the um, reports from the, the workshops very well, and of course also you had the EU institution uh, giving some indication what uh, they want and might and do for organic farming, but also some, some indication then on from the parliament as well, some, also some uh, comments, but also some critical points uh, from the Committee of Regions. So, uh, what are the most important points um, that has to happen to really develop organic in the near future, including regulation, but also other measures. Yes, Marcus, thank you. I think we are really on the right track here on this podium because uh, talking about other policies is very helpful as well to uh, move forward in, in, in the debate on the organic regulation from my point of view. Because my observation today is basically, and that's one aspect which came up in the, uh, in the conclusions as well, um, that there is, to some extent, uh, a wrong approach in the organic regulation discussion. 
Um, and it's probably overestimated the role and importance of the organic regulation to develop and support organic farming in terms of making uh, European Union more, uh, more organic. Um, so why am I saying this? Um, the point there is it's clear that the organic regulation is of crucial importance for the organic sector. We need a solid basis, we need uh, a vital development, uh, but at the same time, um, it's, it's, it's not the only instrument, right? And uh, it's probably not the only uh, or the most important ones. There are many other ones and organic regulation is one of the important ones. Um, and what we need in the first line is we need to have really a consistent and ambitious organic uh, policy framework um, on the European Union level. And uh, to be honest, I think it's really good to, to, to talk honest about that. We don't have this yet. We have got a lot of instruments there. For example, in the CAP, uh, um, research and development was, was mentioned as well. Or well, horizontal legislation on GMOs, on, on, on plant protection uh, products, on seeds or whatever. Uh, there are good possibilities in the CAP, for example, but I'm coming from Austria in the new program. Organic now is, is mentioned as a, and recognized as a new uh, uh, as a single measure, but still the premiums are, are cut really significantly compared to the last period. When Hungary I learned there is no support for organic farmers this year. So um, we don't have this in force in the CAP currently. Uh, or if you look at, uh, for example, uh, research uh, and, and innovation, uh, we are lacking of earmarking, really of the money uh, for, for sustainable farming uh, and organic research there. Or if you look at the seeds legislation, uh, we are still not there that organic farmers are, uh, have got, let's say, uh, uh, acceptable rules for, for breeding, uh, multiplying and, and, and sharing and, and, and trading seeds among the farmers. So uh, there, there are many, uh, many, uh, uh, let's say, deficits there. And it's not that I'm blaming anybody here on the podium or, or, or in the audience that this is the case, but I think it's very helpful to reflect on this. Uh, and it's our, our duty, all of us have to work on this to, to, to overcome this and to come to a more ambitious uh, uh, policy framework. And I think the debate here on other policy issues is, is very important. Uh, it's very important as well that there's an organic action plan which came along with the uh, a proposal for a revision of the organic regulation. But that's a small step because it's not over ambitious to say it like this. Um, it's very helpful as well, I think that, uh, for example, the Latvian presidency has been opening the debate from the regulation to uh, organic farming in general and, 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 and uh, other policy tools at the last uh, uh, informal uh, council in Riga. So these are steps in the right direction, but still we are not there and so far there is no really consistent uh, uh, ambitious policy frame uh, work inside, so we need to work on this. And this brings me back to uh, the, the organic regulation, which is by no surprise that the, the key issue here, of course, it's of, of, of key importance, but when it, when it is sometimes when it is so difficult to, to find a solution and when everybody is, is unsatisfied, uh, it makes some sense to step back a little bit and to, to, to look from it from, from a broader view. Uh, and when doing this, uh, sometimes you realize that something uh, really uh, um, let's say fundamental is, is, is going wrong. Um, and this is the case with the organic regulation debate currently when it comes, for example, to thresholds. Because uh, there we try to address something in the organic regulation which is not an issue of the organic production. So we can rule there the organic production, we can rule the certification uh, there, but we cannot address problems which are not uh, caused or addressable by the organic sector within the organic regulation. So after, let's say, uh, the, the cocktail, there was a cocktail in the train and pants and whatever, uh, to, to use another uh, picture, we, we are using uh, a fork, for example, like, like uh, let's say, a knife. We try to cut our steak with, with the fork instead with, of the, with the knife because we are using the wrong tool to address this. Um, the organic sector is doing the best thing you can do in order to co avoid contamination. We simply don't use uh, uh, chemical pesticides, synthetic pesticides, and that's what we can rule there. Uh, when it comes to, to, to contamination, uh, then it's clearly something which uh, needs to be addressed with, with other tools. And I would really would like to see this ambition of, of, of debate on, on, on contamination when it comes to plant protection 
uh, 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 product uh, when it comes to liability regimes and all these kind of things which would be really the right uh, instruments to, to uh, address this issue. So I think it's very important and very helpful to talk about other policies as well to, to learn something uh, about uh, the organic regulation. And finally, it, it, it was mentioned today, I think, I don't know for, for who, who did it in the morning, uh, but it's clear that the consumers are asking for uh, uh, food without pesticide. We know that. But if you look into the surveys, you uh, will see as well that they're asking it for all kinds of products, for conventional and for organic food. That's very clear there. But this means, on the other hand, organic is doing exactly the right thing. We don't use these pesticides. It's the best way of uh, reducing contamination. We are very good in delivering uh, a high-quality product in that sense. Um, but on the other hand, if we now try to rule it uh, in the organic regulation, it makes organic more complicated, less attractive, more expensive. And in the end, we will have, we'll end up with less organic farming. Uh, means more conventional farming and more pesticides in the end. And so this is the, the wrong way of doing it. So I think once again, it's about the entire policy framework. And um, well, to sum it up, the organic regulation is important, but it's not for everything the right tool and we need a consistent uh, policy framework. Um, and I'm convinced that we are then able to, to push uh, organic farming, that we uh, can make the European Union more organic than it is right now. And I'm convinced as well, if, if we step back a little bit and if you look from a broader perspective at the, at the debate you've got now in, in the Council, and I know it's very difficult to, to, to facilitate the compromise, but if you step back you can say, okay, probably we're really not doing uh, the, the proper thing there. Uh, if you look at it from that point of uh, perspective, I think it will be very easy to achieve a, achieve a compromise. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. And I would now start to invite you to think about uh, how you want to come in and contribute, uh, let's say, developing organic farming together in the different uh, policy areas, including regulation. But uh, meanwhile, you think about uh, one question to Diego, coming back to your first comment, having the Commission uh, fighting for proposals are also kind of soldiers. And you talked about uh, the, uh, the public procurement. Would it not be good measures to give some organic food also to your Commission officials, therefore? because you mentioned the military. I wish I could take that decision. I do it on my own, but, um, but uh, unfortunately I don't have such a power. But while you, while you provoke me, Marco, let me overreact and also provoke you. Uh, I was thinking, I think the representative of the Regents Committee raised something on which I want to share with you. Does the organic sector need a target, yes or no? Uh, a political target, I mean, no, not, um, and, and the reason why I ask him, I have no opinion on that, is just that I, I, I realize that in Europe, sometimes when you set a target, it's very efficient. For example, 20, 20, 20 for the energy. It was decided a couple of years ago, this 20, if so 20% 20 of energy coming from renewables, 20% of, of uh, energy consumption reduction, and today we're in 2015, we are on track, we are going to respect that. So the European Union is going to deliver on the, and now we are thinking about the 2030. So there you have some objectives which have been respected. Imagine one day the Parliament and the Council say, we need organic farming, let's say, by 2030, organic farming should be X or Y. Is it interesting or not? I put the question because in my previous experience, when you have a political goal, normally, it works if the political goal makes sense. But it's a tricky issue. It's a tricky issue. That is just uh, for the after regulation, maybe one should think. And I make the point, for example, today, Austria has more than 20% of, of agriculture coming from organics. It's the only country. Number two is Denmark, number three is, is Latvia. Uh, but the average of the European Union is 5%, 5%. And I wish, all Europe could be like Austria. That would be great, eh? or uh, Denmark. Uh, it's just, uh, Marco, a food for thought. Maybe one day you should think about a goal. Thank you. So you put the interesting question, if it's good, if the whole Europe would be like Austria, which is an interesting picture. So, but putting this back, do uh, you brought the issue in, and if you also want to react, Thomas, um, do we need a goal for organic consumption surface area? Is this needed, helpful, or even counterproductive? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Mm. Uh, I, we in, in the Committee of Regions, we in, in our opinion, in our report, we have uh, said we, we have um, set the goal and it is 10 percent. So our uh, 2020 goal is uh, 10 percent in the Committee of Regions, it's clear. And uh, to tell that in, in Finland uh, our percent is already it is 10, so, though, so it's of course suitable in Finland also, but um, at all, all the European level, this 10 percent is a good goal. So you consider it as helpful to set goals also to, to drive development? Yes, of course, it's very important. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, I would consider this very helpful as well, even though you're right, there are some problematic aspects too. It's not that easy uh, and we need to be aware that we need to not only develop uh, 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 the area under organic cultivation, but the market then as well, uh, uh, going along with that. But still, uh, coming back to my previous statement on, on a consistent policy frame, if you've got uh, such a goal, you can and you have to and you need to align your policy work uh, along this goal. And that's exactly what does not happen here. Uh, and, and I think for that sense, it would be very helpful. If we would have such a goal, I think the cap debate would have been differently because organic would have been playing a bigger role in the end in the cap debate because as a policy maker you have to take into account these policy uh, goals in, the, in that sense. But uh, the, the more important thing is to have this goal. If you then reach it exactly or not is the second thing and it's not that the primary one. Since you have been referring to Austria, I have to say we have had this 20% in our organic action plan and now we are there. So somehow it, it, it might work. So perhaps the 20, 20, 20 goal would also work for organic if you look on markets, land area and subsidies. Okay, I will open the floor for your comments now because otherwise we, we are already in the end. Uh, who wants to uh, get in? Ah, there. Hi, Antonio, I missed you in the morning, so apologies, you have now the floor, but it doesn't mean that you have double time, huh? so please. please. Actually, you granted me double time, you know, because you took it away. No. Uh, I want to give a, a good, uh, Antonio Compagnoni from uh, Council Representative from Italy, uh, a good news that is has been referred about the Expo, uh, Milan Expo, and Milan Expo, I don't know how many of you have been there, it's a place where, you know, it's like a Walt Disney of, of the world, and uh, you have those big players like Coca-Cola and the McDonald's, some nice pavilion like the Austria one that is beautiful, very ecological, some, something to see anyway. Uh, but I think is very good news is that last three weeks ago, uh, through a, the commitment of the whole organic Italian movement, that all together, together with IFOM uh, International, Organics International, IFOM Mediterranean, IFOM EU, uh, and uh, uh, with the auspice of uh, Vandana Shiva, we had uh, an incredible meeting with really a lot of stakeholders in this area of the thematic park of biodiversity that is so small and so far that nobody knows there is there and there is also an organic area that is not even mapped but anyway we are, we are bringing a message and we started up an action network that now you should be receiving invitation everybody every stakeholders in Europe and in the world because we want to demonstrate that organic can feed the planet and we want to bring this document to Ban Chi Moon uh, on the 16th of October so you are all invited not only to come to Milan but also to participate actively in the, in the creation of this document of this position that will also need to make big changes in our minds but we can demonstrate it in the research in the, in, in, in the facts in the practice that organic can feed the planet this was my first intervention Second one, <laughs> I agree on the point that we need to set uh, uh, goals. I had a meeting with my Minister of Agriculture, a new one in Emilia Romagna, and she was, wants to have double uh, the surface of organic. We are nine, we want, she wants to go to 18. And we were talking which way we could go, because there is a big problem. We are missing farmers, especially the one with good brain. They are too old, too conventional. We need to, to make a change, to make more young people unemployed, going out of the industry, going back to the farmland. We need to have more access to land. And we, need to, and we have the expertise. We have a lot of organic farmers that have expertise to bring these uh, people back. And she told me an, a very good idea, because we have recession in many parts of, of Europe, even in Italy, and we have a lot of land that used to be agricultural land, 
close to the city became a uh, building possibility, construction. Uh, but now, with the crisis, nobody's building anymore, luckily. And actually, they have to pay a lot of taxes. So now we could create a guideline or a way for the municipalities, the regions, the different local authorities to say, yes, you can go back to agriculture, but you need to rent this land in a long term to make organic farming, to create short supply chain for, because those, this is, is areas is close to the urban centers, with the expertise of people that are already in the organic farming system, bring them new people in the farmland, and bring a better, and then we can achieve not 20%, 40% in, uh, by to 20, to 2030. Okay, thank you, Antonio, for being relatively short. <laughs> and, okay, somebody else who wants to come in. Here uh, in front. Yep. Yeah. Raise your hand so they can see you. Or stand up. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom Nizet again from Certices in Belgium. I want to kick the ball back about giving organic food to soldiers and to people working in public administrations and linking it, unfortunately, again to the proposal of the new regulation. But I think here you have illustrated yourself that mass catering operations should be part of the scope of the new regulation. Thank you. Okay, nobody else who uh, wants. You have somebody? No, I caught a comment. Um, ah, sorry. Here. Yeah. Joël Catandri Ghetto from the iFarm Organics International Office. I wanted to react to the comment of Mr. Uh, Lapins. Is that right? Um, about when you said, uh, well, the one point that will be tested in this new regulation is the the one on on imports. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm really not sure that it will be that tasty because I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood exactly what you mean, what you meant if you meant that uh, by restricting imports, uh, you will favor the, the domestic producers. Unfortunately, the data that we have about uh, many countries, whether in, in the EU or outside the EU, shows the opposite, shows that by you actually need imports to, uh, to even create market demand, even for the domestic products because the consumers need the full range of, of uh, organic products in order to buy organic, and the processors also need the full range of uh, ingredients. Or perhaps you meant that by um, making bilateral agreements uh, the, the only equivalence uh, option, you will open up uh, markets, for uh, export markets for domestic producers. And again, there I'm very skeptical because by saying it's either compliance or bilateral equivalence, Basically, what you are going to do is you are going to encourage the, the still the many countries in the world that don't restrict uh, uh, imports of organic products from the EU. Many countries at the moment are not closed to uh, EU organic products. Those countries will basically have a strategy of saying, okay, we have to close our markets because that will be the only way to then negotiate a bilateral agreement. So, and we at IFOM, we are, we are advocating to those countries to say, please uh, don't close your markets for the same reason that I'm explaining you. If you want to develop your local markets in other parts of the world, you also need to imp import some European products. But now we are going to be faced with a very difficult situation when we advise them to not close their markets because everybody wants EU market access. And to get it, they will have to first close their markets and then engage in a long process of bilateral uh, equivalence agreement. So I think that will be a lose-lose for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Here, so a different judgment about the taste of cocktail. Uh, Ivas, you want to react? Yeah, thank you. I, 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 th I think you just agreed to me what I said. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One last statement. Yeah. Okay. I thought we had uh, five minutes with you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. So when uh, uh, Diego has unfortunately to leave because he has to catch his plane, so if we can give him applause for discussing with us. And uh, if you want to come in, just raise your hand. Huh? I mean, that's uh, still still possible. We have, I think, around uh, 20 minutes uh, left. So, but coming back, perhaps, of course, as as the regulation is 
one issue which is of our concern. And looking now um, into the short future, I think if I might be provocative, there, I think there are two options. If there is actually next week in the Council an agreement, so we will get into the trial look sooner or later and in autumn because I think, f as far as I observe, there will be an opinion in the Parliament. So, and I think this will be uh, going this way. Um, if there would not be an agreement next uh, week on Tuesday, there might be withdrawal uh, from, from the Vice President of the Commission. So I think these two scenarios, if I assess, um, are possible. Yeah? I think this is what, 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 what can happen. So and if you perhaps give an outlook uh, um, what it means for organic looking into the two scenarios, what, what would be the consequence for organic, because a lot of discussion running on, controversial discussion from all sides, and also how we can get um, a, a, a positive outlook for organic when also um, in, in these scenarios, or not. You might yeah. oh, No, it's okay, I just, I, I, I thought you were asking uh, Thomas maybe to respond to that, but I'll, I'll try to elaborate a bit on that. Uh, but please allow me to also come back to the point about objectives, if I may, uh, because, because really I'm, not that I'm getting overtired about just talking about regulation that I've been doing, you know, since January, but, but I think it really has to be wider than that. And, and speaking about objectives, in fact, uh, there's a Latvian case as well that in our national development plan, uh, somebody suggested to write in the objective of, I think, 15% uh, or so of the land to be managed under organic farming in 2020. And, and where I fully shared, of course, one point there is that if you have an objective, then you have to comply uh, in, in the policies uh, in order to, to uh, facilitate that. But not in every policy and not in every step to exaggerate and, and just you know push everyone aside and say organic is just the number one. Uh, but, but there is a huge point about that. So if you set the target, you have to act. But then even more important than that, I think, is that uh, it should belong uh, to the people who are doing that. So on this example of land, land managed by at whatever percent, I think that objective primarily and first has to be shared and coming from people who manage the land. And this is not government, this is not European Parliament, this is not European Council, this is not region, Regions Committee, this is not ECOSOC, this is not uh, White House or anything, okay? So these are some of us who are sitting in this room, some of us even on the podium, not me, but, uh, but Martin uh, as a farmer. So uh, the, the managers of the land, so that is, I think, the key. Uh, it's not enough that some uh, uh, experts uh, calculate something in the rooms and say, well, uh, we think uh, ambitious enough, you know, 20%, uh, come on. Uh, because then, then the blame is to be put also on the state back or to European institutions or to whoever. So I think it has to really belong to the heart of, of the people who want to uh, do it. And they have to contribute to that themselves, not just waiting, well, where's the second pillar money? Hector payments, uh, where's the investment aid, you know, where's the aid for the, for the building up the processing plant in Latvia, you know, for exporting baby food or anything, which, which are good things, I, I must admit, really good, but it, it can't solely rely on that, so I think there has to be a participation of uh, the people who really then manage that factor that we are talking about that if we want to increase uh, the management of land. The other thing, by the way, if I may share that is, then uh, management of land, of land is good as a target, however, not the only one. And I think there is a strong food dimension. I mean, it was mentioned by colleagues as well here. If, it's, if you speak about food dimension, uh, we have had some bitter experience here in Latvia because we also have had some people who just thought, uh, well, this is, the, this is the way of not even just living, but way of getting subsidies. And that, I think, is very sad because what you have in rural development, you have a green box. So basically, uh, uh, the guys who were sitting in this chair just uh, a minute ago, the Commission, of course, is guardian of the treaty, and of course, it, uh, in, in Geneva, there are deals on what a green box means, and, and, and we were actually trapped in that because we have uh, this spoiled thinking sometimes that when people see money, they think that, well, why should I produce anything? I can just uh, imitate that I'm producing. An organic would mean something like that I'm just uh, keeping the land in good agricultural condition and I'm not using pesticides and chemicals and mineral fertilizers, but you have to produce something. So I think that's also important. But that's just a minor element. And, um, and of course, it's, it's, it's our Latvian experience here. I'm wearing my Latvian hat very much 
but I think a few other countries around Europe have been experienced at this, so we have to be also careful about these policies of, of what we are doing. Now, coming back to your point very, very sharply and closely, oh. we do our best, you know. I mean, we have the weekend ahead of us, and uh, I know that uh, Emmanuel is cooking something as well, uh, you know, when it comes to your organization view, but I think, really, let's keep a mind open, um, because from the discussions that I hear, um, I think in, in the global, more global context than just talking about what's happening in, inside the Council on Tuesday that you will see on the TV screens, uh, you have to also take a perspective of what, of what is happening already in the Parliament and what will happen in the Parliament. And I think there you can see that there is a lot of sympathy, in my reading, huh? there's a lot of sympathy about process-oriented approach uh, to the whole story of it. Where I think some people may be rather disappointed, especially those of, of you who were in working group talking about the regulation earlier this, this morning because I, I um, slipped into the room and I, and I carefully listened to all that, is about controls, of course, where I, where I don't think that you know, there's a, just one Bible about annual controls being good, being good, being good. I think I heard some constructive ideas also about that why should you every year charge uh, if I translate it in practicalities, you know, uh, 700 euros for a farm of over 100 hectares in Latvia here, why should you do that? Why don't you charge uh, maybe another year 100 euros of not looking that deep? I think these are maybe parts of solution. But I think these solutions can come together with Martin at later stages in trilogues, I believe. There will be plenty of discussions because a number of amendments you'll have to deal with. And, uh, of course, from the council side too, uh, headed by Luxembourg, then... Uh, from a few weeks from now, uh, this is immense. And I think there will be more coming because the deadline is 22nd. So I'm, I'm seeing uh, my, my glass is half full. <laughs> it is half full. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so you, you put the ball to you, Martin, uh, Parliament. So, um, Okay, you, you might also just say, where will we be then uh, in December 2000, where we are 2015? I don't know. <laughs> but because uh, I don't know at the end what's, what's coming out in the parliament, what's coming out in the, the council. So I hope we came to, to a conclusion in September. And I don't know how much time we need for the trilogues. Uh, I was involved in the trialogues for the cap reform. We need one and a half year. Um, and I can only say nothing is agreed before all is agreed. There must be all points closed. There cannot be uh, some points be open to try, like in thresholds, to say, OK, we postpone it to 2020, <laughs> and say, we make then an agreement. It's not a good idea. <laughs> I think we must finish this go and start uh, with a better regulation. We need a better regulation. We have not to make it, uh, to try to make, only, to make only a regulation that we finish the work. No, we need a better regulation. And this can, maybe uh, we can finish with the Luxembourg presidency, but uh, the next one are the Netherlands. Okay. Jim? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. no, I think we, we need uh, six or maybe 12 months to finish our work. But let me come back to uh, one main point to the future of uh, organic agriculture. Uh, when you look to the member states and the different percentage of organic agriculture, you see very big difference. Um, in your country, okay, you are the biggest producer of organic. Um, with 12%, uh, and in my region, in Hessen, we are now on 10%, uh, but you see we have one problem. Uh, the organic sector is in the, not in the high-intensive regions. He is in the, in the grasslands, in the, in the mountain regions, but not in the intensive regions. And when you look to Lower Saxony, they have a percentage of 3.2%. Organic farmers have no chance against high-intensive industrial farming. They pay more than 1,000 euro per hectare uh, to rent a hectare. And when you are an organic farmer, maybe with, uh, with 
have a dairy farm, you have no chance against the high industrial uh, conventional farmer uh, with poultry or with, with biogas. No chance. You can pay him from, from European Union, can pay him 500 euros per hectare. He has no chance against the conventional sector. So we must have our focus on the, on the intensive industrial sector. They make a form of agriculture that is uh, not good for environmental. So we have to reduce the input of chemical outputs, uh, chemical um, pesticides. We have to look in the future of regulation of pesticides. We have to look in the regulation of uh, the, um, uh, is, uh, the regulation for fertilizers. Yeah, fertilizers regulation. These are main points in the future. We have to discuss in the Parliament to reduce the intensive, high intensive, uh, conventional farming, so that farmers. Uh, uh, farm, organic farmers have a chance. Um, Mr. Franco says we need 2020-20 strategy. Uh, it's not a good idea. We make for renewable energies. We make a big mistake on 2020-20. We say 20% of biomass. And this is one of the points in Germany on biogas that we make a, a big mistake. And I hope we, we can try to make in the future not so big mistakes like in Germany uh, to promote with biomass, biogas uh, for the renewable energy. This was not a good idea. Okay, thank you. So, and I said if you want to come in, you can come in. And there was somebody raising the hand, so please. Hans-Peter Schmidt, Germany. Martin, you mentioned that you have been in a trilogue before. Please tell us about the trilogue. I have two questions or two remarks. One thing is, I understand that this trialogue is not the trialogue of the Lisbon Treaty, not the formal trialogue. It's an informal trialogue where all three institutions are present with a handful of persons. So it's secret. So people say it's secret. Mm, it's not so democratic. That's not what I worry about. What I worry about is about the working capacity the spiritual capacity you can possibly have when you work like this. So the second step is, when I look at the draft and when I look what the council did, I see hundreds and hundreds of pages, very complicated. And when I look into the details, I see, from my point of view, lots of details where I deeply worry about, like integrity of product, integrity of production, no clear rules about when do you decertify a party? No clear rules about doubtful cases. So very many things of the current, like, uh, the current text are not yet in there. How is it possible? How should it possibly be that the end of the trilogue will be a comprehensive body that somehow more or less has the same kind, at least the same level of functionality as we have now. So I deeply worry. Two points. How does it really work and what do you really expect as a result of that kind of trialogue? Last year you say to me it's not possible to change uh, everything. You say the parliament cannot make a good report. It's impossible. And I look to the last press release of IFARM to my report and say, okay, it's in a good way. Uh, we hope on the parliament to change everything in a good way. So I think uh, trust in me. <laughs> trust in me and my team uh, to change uh, a lot of things uh, in, a, in a good way. To the trilogue, yes, uh, we, we want a first reading, first reading agreement. It's not uh, only an informal uh, trilogue, it's, it's a trilogue. Uh, we find an agreement in, in the ComAgri, and then the ComAgri says the rapporteur has the chance to try in the trilogue to find an agreement before the first reading in the parliament. It's, yet it's not open. Uh, the civil society is not sitting behind me and say, okay, you must do this or said. It's like in the council, 
the trilog, like with the cards, the trilogs are, are not open. But I try to make the dialog in this trilog open to maybe to IFARM or the civil society and other groups to, to make a dialogue with people, but not uh, to the whole community. It's not possible. It's one part of uh, the Lisbon Treaty. I cannot change it. Yeah, we, indeed we cannot change, let's say, the, the rules here on this uh, panel. But I was, as you have all sort of experience, um, regards uh, trilog, what can make us optimistic that we will have in the end a functioning regulation, practical functioning regulation, having then the commission proposal where we know, let's say, more or less where, what we think about, plus then reports of council as, uh, on opinions as well as of, 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 of parliament. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm not, uh, I'm not the best expert in the room, definitely. May, maybe I have some experience indeed, but very limited. Uh, and, and, and like Martin said, you know, I think many of us in, in EU have very, very limited experience. I, I did, however, participate. I was, I was heading uh, a, a trial just recently in Strasbourg about Baltic Sea and multi-annual fisheries plan. So I, I run through that. That was a uh, few hours we did it, uh, about four hours or so meeting. Where you're right is that in that kind of meeting, uh, to my knowledge, normally or if ever, there is no um, other than uh, council, that is the presidency, plus the council secretary general, the commission, MEPs and uh, MEP assistants, uh, members of European Parliament assistants, and legal services present. So, uh, to me, it would, uh, I think, uh, serve a very serious precedent if it was happening so that in trialogues it would be made so transparent that, uh, you know, stakeholders were invited. Uh, to be very frank with you, you know, this is what I think uh, might not be uh, the case, I think, most likely. Uh, without prejudging if it breaks any rules or whatever, I'm not, uh, I'm not that kind of clever bureaucrat to tell in which article, whatever, you know, rules of procedure. Uh, when it comes to the result, I think this is again the commitment from uh, both co-legislators to have a good, good feeling that the impact, that the objectives that we are trying to reach with the Act are relevant, predominant and uh, fulfilled uh, and, and, and bound and respected. Um, in other words, I think normally that's what, that's what it is, that Parliament on its side and then the council on its side acts to understand the consequences of when the act uh, will be implemented afterwards. And I think there is a huge room, and now uh, before the 22nd of June, by the way, any MEP can uh, submit amendments. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's one thing. Yeah? Of course, there's been more than one year that, that there was a process where via 28 member states there was a possibility to influence, I'm not saying to, 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 to dictate, but influence uh, the positions. Yeah? But when it comes to the trial process itself, there are always changes to, to the final text. But I think what we also have to bear in mind, it's a bit of a trust. Um, and in particular, again, I have to say, sorry that Diego is no longer here. I don't know if anybody else is here. I think he, he came alone, uh, to my knowledge. But uh, also when it comes to co commission, I think, in my view, there's this uh, dilemma of a bit of a fiddling around of how much do we trust in between of the institutions, uh, in particular of what council and or parliament thinks about how much should we let to the commission to decide. And um, I wish if it was so that the uh, commission would make a clear political statements as regards to then some of these details that will later on follow on commitment that I think could please uh, many people around the table, also on the council side and at the parliament, so that we understand what's coming up afterwards, so that there is no uh, monster sitting uh, somewhere in, in, in the room, you know, skeleton in the corridor that comes out, ooh, you know, later on. With the, you know, uh, to, be, to be very frank, you know, commissioners are not there for, for entirety of their life. Uh, but what's important then if the commission would then give some relevant statements, I think that's one of the ways out, if I just say about practicalities of how things may happen. The same thing goes for the council that can also make a statement, the council statement yeah, or declaration, then it's the political and normally you don't see that uh, things changing uh, that often. When it comes to language of the article, there are two things. Huh? One, it has to be clear 
uh, on substance. The second thing, it has to be legally sound. Yeah? So you have to check uh, these two elements. And the third thing, it was mentioned also here during, during uh, this row today, is the choice of how much do you put in the basic act and how much do you trust, again, I'm coming back to trust, to the commission as an institution and to experts, some of, some of them who are in this room, by the way, who go to those meetings uh, when discussing implementing and or delegated acts. Because they have an influence over what then will be in the implementing and delegated act in the way of, or, or the way it will be implemented. I'm not saying that you know, they can override this objective and the scope, because that is clearly set in the treaty. Yeah? When you have delegated act, you have to have in the basic act saying what is objective and the scope that we are giving there were more, yeah? uh, basically the idea of what will be there in the, in the delegated and implementing act. I, I, I'm sorry it made a little bit longer than maybe you expected, but I tried to answer your question to the best knowledge I can, I can say and also with some examples. Thank you. No, thanks, Ayvaz. I think this is uh, really interesting and also what we can do here on this kind of conference is to bring a little bit more uh, light into the dark because uh, sometimes you don't know really what's happening and at least uh, this explanation helps. And uh, yeah, I think uh, finally you also said, of course, somehow it legally sounds so in the end the lawyers rule the world. So Hans-Peter, something you know, of course, yeah, partially you say. Okay, but Thomas, you, had, uh, you also wanted to come in? Yeah. Uh, you wanted to come in, uh, perhaps also on Trilog, but as we are also at the end, also give us your outlook where we are in December 2015, or if you want January 2016, this I don't care. How but should uh, I know, Marco? I don't know either where we will be, um, but I know that I from your group is, as the Latvian presidency, uh, honestly fighting for, for the best solution from our point of view, so we are doing our best. For the upcoming council, it, we, we made our position clear. We, we have been drawing from our point of view the red line. It's very obvious to come back to, to, to Jan's uh, image of, of, of the cocktail. Uh, it, it won't taste very well to us, but we are still fighting for, for at least a, a not poisonous cocktail. Um, but whatever the outcome of the, of the council decision will be, uh, we will keep on working on it. Uh, um, and there, of course, there are all these, uh, uh, not minor, but smaller technical uh, um, problems, inconsistency, uh, missing uh, definitions and these kind of things. There are lots of issues we've got on our, uh, our agenda and which are not able to be discussed currently in the STA or in the Council because the Council is sticking only to one or two or three political issues, but there are many uh, smaller, minor ones not to be considered as political issues now which are of huge relevance for, for the organic sector. Uh, and we need to keep on working on this in the trilogue as well. Uh, if it comes to a trilogue. So uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us. So I don't know where we will be, but I know that we will uh, uh, work on it hard. Um, but I know to come back to one aspect you have been uh, uh, mentioning on uh, setting goals and uh, on, on, on the problem that you cannot force farmers to, to, to uh, convert to organic, and I think you are, you are absolutely right. Uh, you need to uh, convert uh, from the, with your heart as well. Uh, but what I know is that there's a huge potential among uh, conventional farmers to convert. Um, in Austria, for example, you might think uh, we are already at, 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 at the edge. Uh, we are not. We have got 20% and we did surveys uh, that at least 20 more percent, so up to 40% of the farmers want to convert. But they need, um, of course, a framework which allows them to convert. That's, that's the point there. And this means that they can make their living from the farming. So it's very much about uh, uh, policy instruments. Uh, the European Union has got to influence this. Uh, it's about remuneration of extra costs. Uh, it can be uh, inclusion of external costs, so true cost tools. So there are many things you can do. And of course, uh, the organic regulation as such needs to be uh, uh, workable. It needs to uh, uh, turn out to be practical. Otherwise, uh, it's the wrong signal towards the farmers uh, for conversion and uh, punishing organic farmers uh, for not using pesticides but for getting contaminated from the outside is totally the wrong signal into this direction. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas. And so I would like to ask you, Ms. Hetel, uh, to also give us your outlook. You might go as your perhaps on the, a little bit more than regulation for the near future, where will we be soon? I don't, I don't know if it is, uh, this is in near future, but when I came to this 
conference and, and participated in the workshop too, I, I very quickly uh, found that uh, the hot potato is the regulation and monitoring. I don't know if it's allowed to speak about it here, but, but uh, and uh, as you know, in, in uh, our report, uh, there was no mention of, of this, uh, this regulation, and after our report, there has, be, has come new elements, for example, the ver verification of compliance at least once a year would still form the base for inspection system uh, on organic farms, but there would be flexibility uh, whether the inspections are done on spot or not. Uh, and according to the new proposals, member states may decide in duly used justified cases that the period between two physical on-the-spot inspections could be two or three years. Uh, this opportunity would be granted uh, to operators with proven low-risk profile and uh, fulfilling the criteria of compliant track record of two or three years. And I uh, this comes not from our report, but I welcome this type of new thinking because it would ease the administrative burden without compromising the main aim of the regulation, trust in organic produce in the eyes of consumers. Um, the new risk-based uh, approach allows new methods of inspections to be introduced. Many part, parts of uh, data collection and inspection can be done off the web. Uh, this year, more than 80% of uh, the Finnish farmers submitted applications for farm subsidies through internet-based portal provided by the Finnish Agency for, for Rural, and Rural uh, Affairs. And the uh, present organic uh, inspection system is no hinder to criminals who would want to commit fraud by, by forging documents. The present system provides stable income for inspection bodies, but the present system doesn't reward the organic farmers with years of clean track record. Uh, I come from a country of which prosperity is much based on mutual trust between people, and we have learned that trust is cheaper than distrust. This is something I wanted to tell you from Finland. Okay. Interesting uh, last statement. And yeah, we also, um, at the end, of uh, our time. So we uh, try to look a little bit beyond regulation also in this session, because I think this is also good, if you look then after coffee break, into the overall vision, it's going even not only just until December this year and, and a little bit beyond, but really on the, on, in 2030. So I think this was then perhaps the slow change from focusing quite on, on, on regulation. Um, yes, I also think, Ivas, you have a coffee break task to explain, Joel, uh, why you're exactly in line, but I leave it up to you both, yeah, if I may say so. Uh, but this is an, an, an really interesting to learn, of course, uh, about this too. And yeah, we have, uh, so I can uh, thank you. I have also gifts, at least for those speakers who didn't get gifts yet, because you both were ready, and otherwise, if I give another uh, Birch sect, uh, you might think feel corrupted then for the 16th of June. And uh, so I, as you understand that I will not do this. Um, so thanks to all speakers. The gifts are arriving for, for it's your first time, Thomas. Jack, I think so. And uh, you had already, right? No. No? <laughs> okay, so thanks. And we will have now a coffee break for um, 21 minutes. And so you're back at a quarter past five here in the room for the launch of the vision. And thanks to uh, all speakers here. And we see you back in 21 minutes. Thank you very much.